In my wrestling and in my doubts, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Whoa, you are the peace in my troubled sea. Silence, you won't let go. In the questions, your truth will hold. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Whoa, you are the peace in my troubled sea. My lighthouse, my to show Roger's introduction, take 34. Okay, Ethan, say good morning. Good morning, Okay. Okay, get ready. I'll, I'll say good Okay. I'll yeah. say good morning. Well, Ethan has to say it first. Okay, go, Ethan. Okay, Ethan, say good morning. No. Ethan, we need you to say good morning. What do you want to say? Say good night. You want to say good night. Okay, Miranda, you say good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good night. Whatever time you might be watching this, welcome to Emmanuel Lutheran Church for July 26. It's been 19 weeks since we were able to join together in worship in person, and next week we're going to be resuming that. Uh, that's August the 2nd. All of July, we have been focusing on God's promises. Our theme verse for July is from 2 Corinthians. God has made a great many promises. They are all yes because of what Christ has done. So through Christ we say, Amen. We want God to receive glory. Pastor Lee's been away on vacation this month, and we've had guest pastors uh, every week, as we've been calling them, mystery pastors. Uh, three weeks ago, we had Pastor Scott uh, Heitz-Susan from Texas, followed by Pastor Matt Henry from Idaho, 
Last week we had uh, our Pastor Emeritus, uh, Pastor Richard Brown from here at Emmanuel. And this week we have Pastor Scott Gavel from Grace Lutheran Church in Drumheller. Welcome to worship everybody. Welcome. Welcome. In the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come. We are gathered together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grace. Hear the joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down, as your people sing. We will rise with you, lifted. Good morning, Emmanuel Lutheran Church. It's nice to be in Lethbridge. It's windy here. I don't know. Uh, I like Lethbridge. My sister went to university in Lethbridge for a couple years. I have an aunt and uncle there. Hi, Mark and Adele. They don't go to your church, but hi anyways. Uh, and what else do I know about Lethbridge? It's just a nice place. You guys have a nice place there. I sang in your church when I was in Concordia Concert Choir. We came down in maybe circa like 2006 or seven or eight. I don't know. I was there. Thanks for hosting us. The potluck was fabulous. And I'm blessed to be here to be able to preach for you, to share God's word with you. I feel I'm in auspicious company. Um, you've had so many good messages, so much um, hope 
uh, that God has given you through these promises all the way through this series, um, from facing doubts and fears to God's promises of community to God's promises of patience and endurance, um, so many yeses on account of Jesus Christ that he has given you already. And so I'm honored and humbled to be able to offer some small part of God's promises of hope for you. Actually, I'm offering you the fullness of those promises, but trying to minimize myself and, and raise Christ up instead. So I guess I never introduced myself, if it hasn't been said already. I'm Pastor Scott Gamble from Grace Lutheran Church in Drumheller. Um, I grew up west of Red Deer in a little hamlet called Markerville. I graduated from the Edmonton Seminary in 2015 and been here in Drumheller for the past five years. So maybe one day I'll get down to see you guys again sometime soon. But um, yeah, be blessed by the word this day, by your continued work and worship um, as a community there, ministering to one another and the community around here, around you, and uh, just receiving God's good gifts today in the word and however, whenever you gather in these coming strange days. So thanks for having me. Um, may God bless you richly and abundantly as always. Amen. The readings for today. The reading for today is Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can, with reverence, serve you. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. And in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. A reading from Romans chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Reading from Romans chapter 15. May the God of hope fill you with all the joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text today, text for our message and meditation, um, is from Romans chapter 5, uh, starting at verse 1. Paul writes, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, join me in a word of prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, you who have risen from the dead, you who are the first fruits of those who will rise from the dead, who have endured much suffering and pain and temptation for us and have gone through that, uh, onto the other side to rest at your heavenly Father's side as you deserve. You call us to that same heavenly rest. You call us to the peace and the grace that we stand in even now through your victory. We hold on to it by hope in this life, looking forward to the fullness of that promise. Help us to hold on to that today as we hear your word as your Holy Spirit points out all that binds and separates us in this life, God. 
give us faith to hold on. You give us repentance to turn back again to you uh, each and every day as we need it. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Well, our, our main text is this Romans passage, Romans 5, talking about hope. Um, but we have our we got sub passage as well, too, right? Second uh, Corinthians um, chapter 1, verse 20. Right? God has made a great many promises. They are all yes because of what Christ has done. And through Christ we say, Amen. We want God to receive the glory. Right? God has made a great many promises, and they're all yes because of Jesus. And today we're looking at the promise of hope. The hope that God has, and he says yes to it. You can have this hope on account of my son, Jesus Christ. But hope is kind of a funny promise, I think. Right? Because it's not really like a thing in and of itself. You know, here's a box full of hope for you. It's not a thing like grace or faith. It's a thing that actually points us to something different, right? We hope in something or we hope for something. It would be strange to think that God has given us the promise of hope. I promise you hope. But here we are talking about exactly that thing. God says, I promise you hope. So what, what does that mean? It's kind of an odd phrase. I think Paul in Romans kind of spells that out, actually. He's actually really, like, creative and artful and really sneaky about how he does this. And if you read Paul in his letters, and especially in Romans, he is so meticulous in how he organizes his thoughts. And it can be super confusing. Um, and sometimes you kind of just gloss over the details. And I, I had this epiphany that it's really kind of like provincial pandemic reopening plans, right? They're really confusing. And you think you've wrapped your head around them one way, and then they all change and everything's different. It's like, what the heck's going on? That doesn't make any sense. And you have to comb through them minute detail by minute detail to mine the meaning from them, right? And it matters for our life, how we can go forward and carry on in these things. There's a lot of similarities here, but especially the confusing part. And so I'm going to go through this reading like a provincial public health reopening plan from the pandemic. We're going through phases. We've got four phases of Paul talking about hope, right? And it's going to be confusing. You thought sermons were here to enlighten you and like make clarity for scripture. Well, you were wrong. I'm here to make it more confusing because that's a provincial public health reopening plans are for. No, that's not true. Um, but that's the way they come across. So uh, let's get right into it. What do we got here? Um, did I miss anything? No. Phase one. Phase one is critical. So phase one, Paul jumps right in. He's been going on about a lot of other things, and so you start with this therefore. That's how you always know you should go back and read the thing that came before it, because it's part of a whole giant argument. But we're not going to, because there's enough stuff here already. Um, so Paul says, therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We want to end up at hope, right? Hope is where we're ending up, sort of. Um, but we're starting with peace. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And it kind of sounds like a pretty good place to start, actually. Right? Our new status before God, on account of Jesus Christ, through his justification, through his death on the cross, is a, not a, just a neutral state. Right? Being justified doesn't mean that we've gotten off unpunished. It doesn't mean that now we can make our way ourselves as best we can from here on out. No, it's better than that. When Paul uses the word peace, he's really thinking about the, is the Hebrew term, Hebrew word for shalom, peace in the Old Testament, which is just packed with so much meaning, right? Shalom signifies wholeness, health, soundness, where there is shalom, where there's peace, things are as they ought to be. 
where the relationship between God and man is concerned, peace means that things are as a gracious God wills them to be, divinely normal, something that we're just craving right now. Peace can therefore kind of sum up all that the Lord can give and all that faith can look for. So you could almost say like in phase one, we're done, look, good for us, we finished it. Peace, that sounds great. Let's just stop there. But there's more, so we'll keep going, right? But there's, as we keep going, there's kind of even more doneness, more completeness, right? Paul says, through him, we also have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. God's grace, his favor, undeserved favor for you. We stand in it already, right? Pay attention to the tense of the verbs that we are currently standing. It is a completed work already done in this grace in which we stand. We have it. We have peace. We have grace. I'm feeling pretty good here, right? Why would we need to go on to hope something that we can't hold on to? I don't know, but the plan says we have to keep going. So let's move on. We're finished. We did the, the end. And then now we're going to keep going to phase two. This is why provincial plans are crazy. And this is why that's a terrible plan for a sermon outline. But here we are. Right? So next, phase two. Paul says that we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. This is where our, our hope portion comes in. But it's also where the confusing part comes in, right? We have this completed, already done thing, and now we have hope. We have to look forward to something, right? That we don't yet already have, but he just said, we already have it. Why do we have to wait? Why is Paul being kind of sneaky here? And this is my theory. This is, this is Paul in his creative, sneaky ways is that he's sneaking in the next part. He says, look, everything is done, and isn't it great, and you'll be so happy. And look, we even have hope that we can look forward to. And before you can ask, but wait, what do I have to hope for? He sneaks in the next part. Not only that, not only can you rejoice in hope, but we also rejoice in our suffering. But pardon? We, re we rejoice in our suffering? I, I, I thought we said it was done, it was complete. Phase one was good. They're suffering in phase two. Oh. That's, that's a thing. And he's boasting in it, right? The word rejoice also means boast, right? He's celebrating. He says, isn't it great that we can suffer? We have this tremendous plan for Christian living. We're just the greatest sufferers that the world has ever seen. We've got this great plan full of suffering that you will rejoice in. We're just so proud of it, right? That's what uh, Paul kind of sneaks in there. And if you aren't paying attention, if you're confused by the phases, then it goes by and you're left scratching your head. But it's critical. It's essential that we don't skip past the suffering because that's what we're living in. That's what we have here and now. If you skip past it and if you just focus on phase one, you'll say, I, there's a mismatch here. I was promised grace and peace, and I'm living in something very not graceful and peaceful, right? And so Paul slips it in under the radar, but it's really, I think, at the heart of how we get to hope. And Paul knows that too, right? So we're going to talk about suffering for a little bit in this beautiful, wonderful, warm, fuzzy sermon about hope. In part because I was... I feel like I was just gifted this podcast that I listened to this week um, about suffering. And it actually it comes from, this is not a normal topic for me in my sermons, uh, from a Buddhist author. Um, there was a discussion about this book by Pema Chodron uh, and her book, When Things Fall Apart. This is the disclaimer portion, right? I obviously don't recommend searching for religious truth in other religions. Um, but all people, regardless of what they believe, what religion they're in, or if they have no religion, all people have a natural knowledge of God, some understanding that there's something else out there. Even if they're an atheist, usually they still believe 
That's a whole other thing, not even going in. Um, and they also have a natural knowledge of our common human experience. We all live this life together. And so, especially our sinful nature, people have really incredible insights into the brokenness of the world around us. And so sometimes these observations can really help illustrate beautifully or powerfully what God says about humanity or about even himself in the Bible. People can corroborate some of those things outside of, you know, the full revelation of who Jesus is, um, but especially our sinful condition. So in all these things, this is the big disclaimer, in all these things, we are free to take what we want, to take what is beneficial and lines up with scripture and use it for our benefit and discard and push aside those things that uh, don't line up with God's truth. And so that's what I've done for you. I've distilled down all the goodness um, because I think there's a lot here. So from Pema Chodron, she writes, in Tibetan, there's an interesting word, ye tang che. The ye means totally, completely. And the rest of it means exhausted. Altogether, ye tang che means totally tired out. We might say totally fed up. It describes an experience of complete hopelessness, of completely giving up. This is an important point. This is the beginning of the beginning without giving up hope that there's somewhere better to be, that there's someone better to be, we will never relax with where we are or who we are. How does that feel right now? Totally exhausted, completely fed up. Can you relate? Right? Suffering can come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes, but all godly suffering leads us to the realization that we don't have it all together. And then no matter how hard we try, we can't make it better on our own. We can dig into that more. There's more from Chodron here. She goes on. To think that we can finally get it all together is unrealistic. To seek for some lasting security is futile. To undo our very ancient and very stuck habitual patterns of mind requires that we begin to turn around from some of our most basic assumptions. Believing in a solid, separate self. Continuing to seek pleasure and avoid pain. Thinking that someone else is responsible, is, is some, that, that someone out there is to blame for our pain. One has to get totally fed up with these ways of thinking. One has to give up hope that this way of thinking will bring us satisfaction. Suffering begins to dissolve when we can question the belief or the hope that there's anywhere to hide. The first half of that passage, if that is not a spot on description of the reality of our sinful nature, I don't know what is, right? Very ancient and very stuck, habitual patterns of mind, believing in a, a solid, separate self, like one that doesn't need God to succeed, continuing to seek pleasure and avoid pain, thinking that someone there is someone out there to blame for our pain. This is the reality we all know far too well. This is what causes us suffering and hardship throughout our lives. Right? And then the second half of that passage is really a lot like Luther's theology of the cross. Right, which is an essential part of our Lutheran understanding of how God interacts with the world, the theology of the cross. And so here's some quotes from Luther that like dovetail really nicely with this understanding that you should actually give up hope. Right? Suffering means you should just give up hope, which seems like a weird way to get to hope, but we'll get there, trust me. Um, so this is Luther. He says, it is certain that man must utterly despair of his own ability before he's prepared to receive the grace of Christ. 
utterly despair of his own ability. That's the hopelessness we need to feel before we can feel real hope. Right? And it might feel harsh at times, but also at the right time, it feels free. There's more of Luther on that. Right? Luther writes, the law brings the wrath of God. It kills, it reviles, it accuses, it judges, it condemns everything that is not in Christ. Everything that we put on to try and make ourselves better, to succeed more, to do a better job. Yet, that wisdom, that wisdom that everything is killed that's not in Christ, that wisdom is not in itself evil, nor is the law to be evaded. Without the theology of the cross, man misuses the best in the worst manner. Right? We take the hope of life with God. And without dying to ourselves, without abandoning all hope and realizing we can do none of it on our own, without suffering, as Paul says, we swap it out for fake hope, for hope light, right? We, we try and operate on a hope that tells us in every day and in every way, I'm getting better and better. And I don't know about you, but most days that feels like a lie. I don't feel like I'm getting better and better. And for me to be able to admit it feels like freedom, right? If we are honest with ourselves, we know that's a lie. Pema Chodron, the Buddhist, knows it. Luther knows it. Some days I know it. Other days, I'm still trying to convince myself that I'm going to pick myself up by my bootstraps and fix all my problems and make it all right. What about you? Do you know it? Have you been here before? Are you there right now? Totally exhausted. Well, if you are, well, you're in exactly where you need to be to receive real hope, real hope. But first, we have to go through phase three, on to the next phase. Phase three moves us from suffering through to hope, right? But hope was actually like back in phase two, but it's also like in phase four, so there, it's confusing for entry opening plans. This confusing phases, there's phases. This is phase three. We're moving from suffering to hope. There you go. So phase three uh, moves us, as Paul writes, some of probably the more memorable words from scripture for us. Um, he writes, suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope, right? You could write a whole sermon on each one of those things. Right? on suffering, on endurance, on character and hope. But we're already talking about hope and kind of a little about suffering. So we're just going to kind of zoom in and just or zoom out and get the takeaway. Right? And the takeaway, I think, is that it's about progress, that it's about process. It's about moving forward and transformation slowly over time. This isn't a formula or a 12-step program that if you follow these things, then success will surely be yours. No, we're still talking about suffering, right? These are the things that happen as we suffer that enable us to go through suffering and come up the other side with the promises of God. So uh, Martin Franzman, a Lutheran theologian, he uses the ideas of an athlete and a soldier to talk about these things. He writes, he says, these sufferings discipline us and temper us. They produce endurance, that resilient and athletic temper, which is so, fewer, so sure of the future that it can live of the future and bear manfully of the pressure of the present. 
right? I love that phrase, that it can uh, live of the future, right? Because that's what hope does. It looks at the promises we have and that grace in which we stand. Way back to phase one, when things were completed in phase one, it looks to the completion, to that. The future grace and peace that we have now, to some extent, draws that in to live in that here in this place. So it sees the present as the stairway to future glory. And it resolutely climbs the stairs one by one by the light that falls on them from the open door at the head of the stairs. That's the hope that we look towards, that stairway to heaven. And so this step-by-step -step living leaves its mark on us and produces character. Um, athletes, that's right, athletes. So just athletes have goals. They look forward to competing at the top of their tier, whatever it is, right? Look towards the Olympics or competing in the NBA or the NHL. Those are the things that drive athletes to do what they do, that make their daily routines as mundane or awful to endure injury and suffering pushes them forward to accomplish what they want to accomplish. We, as those who are training our minds and our bodies and souls for the kingdom of God, are training as well. And our goal is that heavenly kingdom, that light that falls on us from the stairway. And so we are able to endure our sufferings. We're able to train and walk step by step each day to endure through things because of that hope set before us, right? It's that which comes back into our lives here and now that enables us to go forward and live in whatever circumstances we find ourselves in, right? And it's this step-by-step -step living that leaves its mark on us. It produces character, Fransman writes. The flustered new recruit becomes the tempered veteran. Right? As we began this journey as believers in Jesus, we didn't have endurance. Suffering was, looked the same for anybody else. It sucked. We don't like it. But now, as we've grown in our faith, as the promises of God have sunk deep within us, they've left their mark. We don't look the same. We don't look at the world the same. Right? The chaos and uncertainty that's around us is okay, we can deal with it because we know the ending. No matter what happens, we know what has already happened for us in Christ. And so we get to phase four, the end. Phase four is simple, just phase four. Hope, capital H-O-P-E, hope, right? And not that empty, vacuous hope, hope in maybe things will get better, maybe I can try harder today, not the hope that's going to leave us feeling completely distraught. No, hope in a sure and certain thing in Christ. Fransman writes again, he says, with every step we take, we know more surely that the light at the head of the stairs is a light that we can walk by, right? As I trust in God's promises and I endure and build character, I see more and more that yes, this is the life worth living. This is, even though I'm enduring sufferings, what God has called me to, his promises are faithful. It does not fail as Fransman writes, and he goes on, that is hope. No half-hearted, wistful longing for a better day, but a resolute taking refuge in God at every step of the way, in the mounting and triumphant confidence that will take us all of the way. I love that phrase, resolute taking refuge. It's in, in one one phrase, both completely active and completely passive, right? We actively, resolutely take refuge. We 
move forward to do an action to come into God's presence, but by coming into God's presence, we do nothing and, and receive the things he has for us. And so living in hope, building that endurance and character is nothing but this here and now, what we're doing, you being filled with the promises of God, you having your way lit before you in the midst of the darkness, in the midst of the worry and the fear and concern to have those stairs lit before you to say, I can walk again. I can take another step forward. That is the hope that we have as we gather together as God's people, whether in person or over the internet. We have this communion of believers that helps us take refuge in God. At the start of the pandemic, uh, or the start of the lockdown, I suppose, um, as I phoned around to people, I was expecting certain things, having watched the news, having heard and talked to family members and friends of the fear and the worry and anxiety going on there. And so I'm phoning around to, to church members, to other believers, and, and I was pleasantly surprised at the hope that they had how they had character, how they were able to endure, to say, yeah, it's crazy out there, but we're okay. Things are gonna be all right. We know the ending, Pastor. We know that whatever happens, life will carry on. If not in this world, then in the, the next. I could die from COVID-19 tomorrow. I'm not concerned because God has given me hope of the peace and grace that's already won for us in Jesus Christ. Right? And as we live in that reality more and more each day, as we take from the future to live in the now, we look different to the world around us. That's the greatest witness that we can give, we can have and offer, is that they look at us and say, why aren't you scared of all the diseases out there? I can gladly love and serve my neighbor by staying home, by doing all the things I need to do, whatever that looks like. But I don't need to be afraid because I've got a God bigger than this. I've got hopes and promises much grander than whatever suffering this life may have to offer. Even greater than the best things I have in this life. I'll compare them as filthy rags to the riches that I have through Jesus Christ, my Lord. That's the hope we get to live in today. What a great promise of God. What a great yes and amen and all the glory to him. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It's a life everlasting. Amen.
Hey everybody, Tyler here. I just wanted to do a little follow-up to our introduction uh, that we did. My pronunciation of our uh, pastor, our former pastor's uh, title as emeritus was more of a pandemic type of pronunciation, the, the wrong emphasis on the, the syllables. And uh, I pronounced, I think, as emeritus, uh, which is, uh, I guess, my pandemic mindset coming through in making everything sound like a virus. So uh, Pastor Richard Brown is not a virus. He is our pastor emeritus and uh, we love him. And I just wanted to clarify that. And we didn't want to do another take because we did about 30 something takes on that. Um, it's pretty difficult when you have toddlers uh, to, to do these introductions. Have a good day, everybody.